is within math, science, and STEM. So within elementary and secondary level. Um, today, everything that we go over today is basically on strategies for inclusive teaching. And this is whether you are a K-12 teacher, um, whether you are in the library, <laughs> Whatever it is that you're doing, because we are all here at AU. So how can we be more inclusive with amongst our colleagues? How can we be more inclusive with the students that we work with? How can we be more inclusive with everyone that we come in contact with? The first thing that we're going to do is what I like to call a connecting activity. I don't like icebreakers because all they do is break the ice. I like to do connectors because they get us to find out more about one another uh, in a way that we really wouldn't do naturally. So in your QR code, uh, you'll see a uh, folder in the Google Drive that says connector. There are six bingo cards in there. You can pick one. One is yours. It doesn't matter which one you pick. Um, in Zoom, you all are going to be put randomly in groups for the next 15 minutes, taken in and put out. And you all are going to surround yourselves and you all are going to make connections with the people in the room. And we're going to make sure uh, for the next 15 minutes to see who can make connector first. Okay? I'll let you all I see we're still trying to get it. That's fine. That's all right. <laughs> you got it? No. Here's no here. phone. Right there. Okay. <laughs> all right. So again, use the digital bingo cards with a grid containing statements relating to technology, teaching, and inclusion. You're going to mingle in person and on Zoom, and you're gonna find others who resonate with the statements and mark their names. Now I know technically you can't mark their names, but because we are digital, you can use your nice little finger and mark initials for the person or put write their names with your fingers in the box. The first person to complete a row shouts connection and briefly share their findings. Okay, are we ready? Yes, yes, you can pick any one. It doesn't seem like the timer is starting there, but I will start it here. So that's not a problem. So go ahead and start now. Your 15 minutes has begun. All right.
something that I, I haven't tried before. Um, I think it was in the question that my connector connection had asked me. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, using. I definitely use social media, but I think it was like using interactive technology within. Whereas I feel like my classes are very. Um, oh, okay. Dialogue based. Okay. So okay. That could be something to incorporate. Okay, so using technology so it's more interactive within what you do with your students. Okay, anyone else? Yes. So I, I asked this of Kay, my name is Winfield, um, uses technology to provide personalized learning experiences. Oh. So I use technology and I do use personalized, but I don't necessarily think I'm pushing the envelope on using technology. Okay, That's so it's now it's, now it's combining the two of them that you use separately now to making them as one thing that you're doing. Okay, perfect. Anyone else? Sorry. Okay, no, you're fine, you're fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now let's talk about why inclusivity even matters. So we have this right here, and I know you really can't see it, but there's seven parts with inc inclusive education. So if we have here, we have teaching and learning about cultures and, and religions. We have exploring multiple identities, uh, preventing prejudices, uh, promoting social justice, teaching AI students, uh, teaching all students, choosing, uh, choosing appropriate materials, and adapting integrative lessons appropriately. Now, I know in some way, shape, form, or fashion, we use one of these when we're doing it, or we may use multiple, but I know even for myself, I might not use all of them at one time. And, and honestly, that's okay, because sometimes it becomes overwhelming. It can be very overwhelming because we don't know when to use what and how to use it. So the first thing that you need to do is know your audience. Know who it is that you're working with and what can benefit them. So, for example, for me, the first day of class, which is going to be for me next week on the 17th, I will give my students a survey asking them how it's best for them to learn. And here is your syllabus. Here are the assignments that are due. But... Are there any tweaks or changes that we can make collectively to the assignment that will be best for you? And then as a class, let's discuss it. Because even though our syllabus are, you know, kind of binding, it doesn't mean that this is the end all that be all because everyone is different. Everyone learns differently. Everyone thinks differently. So how am I going to make this learning best for you so that when you leave my class, you've gotten what you need to get from it? When I am doing these sessions with adults, it's the same thing. Okay, so let me think about what it is that I've said or what it is that I've done and how can I teach myself that even if midway through it, somebody doesn't understand and I might need to cut my session short with what it is that I think that I need to go over and then do exactly what it is the audience needs for me to. Because just because I think it's important doesn't mean that it's necessarily important. Um, with that, that also means that we have to just support the learning environment of everybody. Um, I know that everybody isn't always a visual learner. So what does that look like and sound like for someone else? Um, if somebody needs to type things up, okay, what does that look like and sound like for that person? Um, if somebody prefers with that need to record something and then let's submit it that way, that's fine with me too. As long as it works. The next thing is engagement, motivation, and overall success. I don't want everybody to be successful. That, that's it. We just want everyone in any aspect of the, uni of the university to be successful. 
We want our colleagues to be successful. We want the groundskeepers to be successful. We want anybody that's working in the cafe to be successful. We just want everybody to be successful. But what does success for all look like for each individual? And that's where we need to think about how we do things. So we usually say, okay, we're going to create safe spaces. And I want you all to take that word safe out of your vocabulary because technically there's no such thing as safe spaces. Nowhere is entirely safe. But what we want are accountable spaces. We want spaces where people can express the way that they're feeling, but also be accountable for their actions. So that means if you've done harm to someone, I should be able to tell you, this is what you did to me, this is how it made me feel, and be able to have a dialogue about it. But also in retrospect, if that person is not ready to have a conversation about the harm that has been done, allow them to have that free will about not wanting to have said conversation. Because we can't make people do what they don't want to do, but we can hold them accountable for their actions. So therefore, Holding space for accountability is what we want. So therefore, having inclusive practices, doing inclusive teaching, having inclusive spaces means that we create an accountable space to foster, foster one-way inclusivity for everyone. This means that, again, Everybody knows that in this space, in these four walls, that everybody here is held accountable. You speak your mind, but also know that whatever comes out of your mouth, you're going to be held accountable for whatever it is that you may say or do. And that I am going to hold you accountable whatever, for whatever you may say or do. But then I also appreciate the fact, the, the, the fact that you've given me the space to be able to say those things. Now, here's the thing with accountable spaces. You have to create norms. You have to create those norms. You have to create the space so that when we're in this space, when we have, these are the norms that we set into place that when we're here, this is how we speak to one another. This is how we have dialogue. This is how we talk about certain things so that we can hold one another accountable. And just perchance, if someone is harmed in the process, we do have a restorative circle so that we can restore the harm that was done. And that's hard. So, those things are hard. But if we're saying we are having inclusive spaces, we have to do the things that are hard. I, I tell people all the things all the time, you have to do hard things. Like sometimes you, you just have to do hard things. And in the end, most times, both sides benefit from it because you get to know one another better but you also get to know where each other is coming from because nobody is in the same in all of their thinking nobody even if we're my husband and I are from the same place same city do we think the same absolutely not <laughs> went to the same high school but sometimes I sit and I'm like, <laughs> did you really just, did that really just come out of your mouth? But we have had, 
we have created norms in our home that we can ask one another mm -hmm. about but sometimes the crazy things that may come out of one another's mouth. And it should go the same way for whatever environment that we're in. And again, it may look different for every one area where they're in. My classroom might be look totally different from your classroom. When you walk into mine, you might think, oh my goodness, uh, Professor Hunter Rupert's classroom is utter and total chaos. But I'll tell you, my, my students absolutely love it because we have set in norms about what it is that we do or we don't do. Uh, in our office, you might come into our office and everybody's talking at one time. But everybody knows the discussion that's being had. Again, is office norms about what's done and what's not done as well. And everywhere has those. So as you all are continuing your journey with inclusivity, I want you to think about no more safe spaces, but more so accountable spaces, creating a space of accountability by being sensitive and acknowledging the diversity and the individuality of everyone around you. Any questions or concerns about that? Uh, do you have any recommendations for like how to create this in an online forum? Oh, absolutely. So, hence we have an online forum right now. If, if perchance this was going to be only online, and everyone here was, we were all doing this in Zoom, right? Before we began, um, I would probably give you three things about what it is. One. Everyone can speak their mind. Um, two, everybody's um, everybody's um, conversation or thought process is valued. And that the third one is that expect that you won't, you may leave here without any closure. Those are the three things that I go into especially the last one because a lot of times we enter into situations and we're always expecting closure for something but you won't always get closure with with everything so but those three things especially because i, I work within culturally relevant pedagogy those three things work for me but they might not work for you with your online presence so therefore, you have to decide, okay, what is it that it is that you're wanting from who it is that are in your class or your setting? Also, what is it that they want as well? And ask them. I say that it's, it's always great to ask because therefore, then you can make this familial decision as a group and then if somebody then messes up, you can go back and say, again, holding them accountable yeah. for their actions, saying, we created these norms together as a collective, as a family, and this is what we came up with. Maybe we need to revisit these. Yes. What did you mean by it? Um, in an online environment, sometimes there won't there won't be closure. Like, how would that contrast with an in person? Oh no, 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 no. It, so sometimes when you're in person, a lot of times people come back. <laughs> I've had situations where I've had classes where they're online, and if it's strictly online, if they choose not to log in, they just don't log in. Or if they choose not to show their face, they don't show their face. But well, if we're in a classroom, I'm seeing you. I'm here. I'm, I'm interacting with you. Mm -hmm. Now, if you choose not to interact with me, at least I can go to you. And if I've done a breakout and everybody's working, I can call you out and I'm like, hey, what's up? Is, is everything okay? Is there something that you want to talk about? Um, it's kind of awkward sometimes on Zoom to, to say, okay, I'm going to pull this person in the breakout room. Who wants that? <laughs> Nobody really wants that at times. But then 
Sometimes you'll have somebody that turns off the camera. Do you really even know if they're even there? Are they even really participating anymore? So to expect the unexpected and the lack of closure um, is more so that it can be more inundating on a Zoom than it is in person. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, okay. Anyone else? Okay. Did that answer your question? It did, yeah. Oh. Oh, and I hope I answered yours. Okay, great. Okay, so we're going to take the next five minutes to think about this reflection. And I want you to talk to anyone you want to in the room about it. And it is inclusive teaching is not just a pedagogical approach. It's the commitment to recognizing and embracing the unique beauty in every learner fostering a tapestry of knowledge woven within threads of diversity. I know that's a lot, magical words in there. We have some bonus points in there somewhere. <laughs> so when you break it down, what does all of this, what does it really mean to you, okay? So I was hearing some wonderful, wonderful conversation. Um, just some conversations about even the ability to even have these conversations with those around us. Would anyone like to share anything that, that popped out for them, that came up for them within their conversation? Yeah. Well, we were um, sharing a little bit about trying to embrace the unique beauty in uh, difficult students that are like pushing our buttons in different ways and really trying to figure out like what can we find that is like beautiful about that interaction and just thinking about the challenges. Okay. Um, do we have any people on Zoom that share? Is there anyone on Zoom that that share that want to share in the chat? And um, I can we can read out for you all um, as we're waiting for them to share out, um, or even for them to come off mute if they want to. Um, anything else that came up for you all? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. You go ahead. Okay, uh, well, we were just talking about the, um, uh, how constraints, so the expectations of, of outcomes can really get in the way of this. So making space for everybody to learn at their own pace. I know they have a course coming next that if they don't know the stuff mm -hmm. that you're sort of, we've all decided uh, as a faculty they need to know, there's sort of this impulse to keep moving, which can really disrupt and distract. It's like, yeah, I understand you learn a different way, but we all got to move, right? And that sort of urgency, which is such a classic trap for moving away from inclusive practice, like mm -hmm. it's, it's just in particularly budget. There's another place where, you know, it would be nice if we could have resources and tools and technology and support and counseling and coaching, but, right? right. But the budget doesn't let us, be, and we, we can't um, overspend, right? So there's these constraints that make it really hard mm -hmm. to live those values to the fullest in the classroom and in the university. That makes sense. No, it does make sense. Um, I think in, in regards to that, 
I know, you know, sometimes what I do as far as like not having the money to do the thing, sometimes I put it out there um, in my social media aspect and saying, this is what I'm lacking. Even at the university level, this is what I'm lacking. And I need volunteers for A, B, C, and D who can help. A lot of times I, I can't help. Um, because people don't people don't realize it's not just K through 12 settings that are lacking, it's education, period. So even on the university scale, we are lacking a whole lot as well. So how can those who think that we have it all realize that we actually don't and we need your help so that those of who decide to continue their educational career can do so successfully. Um, you were saying? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, this was sort of an, a thought epiphany that I was having right at the end of our conversation in that I think, and it was sort of in the context of dealing with challenging students or students we can't get motivated in some way. And I think it's important to recognize that not all students are gonna be as in love with the subject matter as you want them to be. And that's okay, right? They shouldn't love everything equally because then they love nothing, right? So recognizing and letting that be okay and not taking it personally and not somehow. But it's okay to take it personally. You think? Because yeah. we're all people. As long as it doesn't affect your like that, how you yes, evaluate them that yeah yes so, so just expecting that mm. and not being thrown by it i think is an important thing to keep in the front of your head because i love cell biology but not everybody you are you are yeah, yeah. <laughs> i am nothing but cells that's right that's right yeah, you have to them. yeah. so that's uh, one of the things that i um, take from a previous Amparan conference, and maybe some of you uh, were here for this. Uh, there was a speaker who came from outside AU, and he spoke about labor-based grading and labor-based contracts with some mm -hmm. nods. Um, but, but in terms of recognizing someone's perspective and recognizing their uniqueness, I think there are two, two different threads that you can follow. One is to look at their effort and their labor and how much they have invested, even if they don't like cell biology, they've really poured a lot of effort into it, recognizing and validating that, but also their perspective. And maybe it's not always that they're consistent with their effort or their labor, but their perspective is one that's is different or is particularly unique to them. Um, I was just saying, I, I have a class where we have topics on criminal law and I had a police officer who was taking the class and he has absolutely a really important perspective as being a police officer. So. I think it's there are two, two different ways of, of thinking about those uniquenesses and recognition of the individual's contribution into the tapestry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up um, because when we think about grading, like sometimes we're so stagnant, like if they don't turn it in, this is what you get. I take issue with that. I really take issue with that because Suppose the assignment doesn't really work for them in the way that we've given. And what if they have given you an alternative way of doing it, but it still meets the criteria? I remember, I love math. I'm a math person, had hands down, I have always been. But I went to school with American education by day. My parents are Jamaican, so when I went home at night, I had British education. So I grew up with two forms of education. So when I went to school, everything was mixed up, mixed up. So when it came to math, it was like, I can do all of this. This is, I can do it all. When it came to calculus, I had one teacher, and she was just like, if you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> That, that was it. That was, that was it for her. Her thing was, yeah, these are the rules. These are the formulas. But Marla, if you can do it, say you can do it three times in the way that works for you, I'm forward. And that blew my mind because nobody allowed me to do it that way. And I took it with me now as an educator, thinking of that way for my students. 
Okay, yeah, this is what's in the syllabus. Yeah, this is what I require. But let me close this door real quick. <laughs> real talk. Here's the syllabus. Here's the assignment. Is there another way you can do this that works for you? Or you can get all the elements done, but it works for you. Oh, you can? I'll, I'll accept it. Now, yes. I didn't want to interrupt you. No, go ahead. What were you saying? I was just going to say, I per this is my first time as an adjunct, but I personally have two children from my womb who are now first years and third years in college, and one of them will take the chat GPT way and have no shame whatsoever, and the other one will go to the card catalog in the university and like read every primary source and take notes with her hands and never, ever, ever use any shortcut. So like, I just wonder with all these sessions about AI that we did not go to and we came here instead, when you say, you know, cause I will allow my students to use ChatGPT. How do you do this? I, and I teach them how to use, use it. But how do you like kind of balance that? With because I, I, te I teach them how to use it. I mean, cause I know they're going to use it. I'm not going to sit here and deny the fact that they're going to use it. And I'm going to tell them, I know when you use it, but come on now, let's be realistic with how we're using it. This is how it looks when we're using it. So what are other ways, other shortcuts that students might come up with in those conversations that they're like, look, this is what works for me. Like personal examples for me would help because I've been- Yeah, sure. So matter of fact, um, key assignment that I had, that, that we had, um, was that, that they had to create like a STEM assignment, like a STEM fair kind of, but it only had to be for certain grade levels. I like to prepare for it before. I don't like to be waiting until the end if you have to do this assignment. So how does it look like before? How are we going to get ready for this? How are you going to get ready to put this on? What is this going to look like? Who are you going to have to talk to in your school? What are, what are the things that you're going to do? How are you going to get the news out? One person, he's like, he go to social media. I'm like, oh, okay. So how are you going to do this? How are we going to prep this assignment with your, because they work in PLCs. So how are you going to prep this assignment with your PLC that you all are now doing this fair online via social media so that everyone can attend because not all parents can show up. They said and they thought about it because that was not in the assignment. They came up with a way to host the live and every single one of them did a live at different segments in time to host the fair, to host several different activities. They put different things on and they, they um, tagged me in it so that I could then um, what is it? Repost it. They also tagged American School of Education. Um, they tagged their school in it so that the school could repost it so that everyone could see it. That's what they decided to do. The assignment is done. They got their A. I was fine with it. But that's what they chose to do, and that's work that worked for them. Some other ladies decided that they wanted to do just a group of students, not a whole collective, because they couldn't get everyone together. So they brought in a collective of students to do a collective of experiments and then videotaped it and aired it on their school news channel. That's how they got theirs done. Didn't matter to me how they did it, even though there was a way how to do it in the syllabus. But you got it done. And it turned out great. And I was fine with it. Does that work? Did that answer? Okay. okay. I'm making sure we're okay, we're still good on time. Okay. Did anybody say something in the chat? Yes. yes. Um, Laura Gibson said something that I thought of related to fostering a tapestry was the idea of using comments as a learning experience. Asking a student who made an offensive comment why they said that what made them think that, which gives other students an opportunity to learn about other perspectives and why people think the way that they do. And Mac responded that, um, I love that Laura, asking students to explain their responses also helps students who said the thing to reflect 
on what they wanted to say. It's a key component of calling in versus calling out. Mm, I like that. Yes. Again, we're holding them accountable. Laura and Matt, thank you. We're holding them accountable for what it is. We're not calling them out and saying, oh, you shouldn't have said that. That was wrong for you to say. Because really, was it really wrong for them to say? It's their feelings. Um, if you have these norms in your class for them to speak their mind, now they've spoken their mind. The next process in it is talking about what it is that they've talked about. So now I'm asking you about what you said and why you said it. Why do you feel the way that you feel? And sometimes some people don't even know. And if they can say, I don't, it's okay to say, I don't know. And if you don't know, this gives you time to now think about why you don't know. And then to think about why what you may have said may have hurt or harmed someone else. Thank you, Matt and Laura. Anything else in the chat? Okay, great. Anything else from anyone here? Okay, are we so far so good? Good. Oh, not working. Oh, technology. Okay. So now we have these three things. So we're looking at recognizing and valuing diversity, fostering a sense of belonging, cultivating empathy and cultural competency. So I'm gonna start here with the empathy part. So first day of class, me. After I've gone over any norms and everything it is, I actually tell my students, whether you learn anything from me this semester or not, the one thing I want you all to learn from me is that um, what, how religious you are or, or not, grace and mercy. I'm big on grace and mercy. As a student, you come to me and you want me to do things for you. And you want me to give you these, extend you this grace and mercy, whether you've been sick, whether you just didn't show up to class, whether you were tired, I mean, we're human. Whether you missed like four, five, six assignments and you need to turn them all in before you get an F, like you want me to extend this grace and mercy to you. And you know what I'm going to do? I am. I am. I'm going to extend this grace and mercy to you because the thing is, you're paying all this money for school, whether it's a loan or you're paying cash money. I don't want you to fail. I want you to be successful. So that means I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that you're successful. And that looks different for every single last one of you. Because every single last one of you are going to ask me for different things at different times. All I'm asking for you all, the same grace and mercy that I extend to you, you extend to others. Whether you decide to continue teaching in the classroom or you decide to leave the world of education and go out into the workforce, the grace and mercy that Professor Hunter Hooper extends to you, I need you to extend that to others. I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. um, very pro grace and mercy. I'm not, but and for many students, that seems to be just permission to have even more trouble managing the demands on them. But it doesn't. And let me explain why. Because I tell them outside of their job, this is their job too. I didn't make you come to school. <laughs> I didn't make you sign up for this class. I didn't make you decide to go into education. You decided to do this on your own. If you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. You know what to 
do if you think this is not for you. And honestly, this is not for everybody. So if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be, and I'm not going to beg you to. But if you're going to be here, you're going to do the work. We're going to have fun doing it, but you're going to do the work. So they understand the expectation I have of them because in turn, they have an expectation of me because I then explain to them at the end of the, end of the year, they got to grade me too. I got to get, a, they got to fill out this paperwork on me at the end. So if I'm grading them and they're grading me, how are we going to do this together so that everybody is successful? I've never had anybody to abuse it. Yeah, and, and it wasn't about abuse. It's just about without the structure, without endless extension. No, there, so there's no endless extension. But what there is is a case-by-case -case yeah. situation. The syllabus says, but look, this is what the syllabus says. But I also know that people have situations. Things happen. And I think for your role as an education teacher, mm -hmm. that's an appropriate modeling that you're doing. Just like I'm teaching a strategies of stress management course. Mm -hmm. And my, my assignments are going to be to write about something, whether they were writing about the thing they did or whether they were writing about the stress they felt because they couldn't do the thing that they were supposed to do. You know, but either way, it's stress. And either way, that's the topic of the course. And so just like with you, being an educator requires grace and mercy. And so you're modeling it, you're demonstrating, you want to practice it in the classroom with them. And hopefully they'll go on to educate others and be graceful, merciful teachers like mm -hmm. you were to that, you know, right? So we're, and if you, you know, maybe you're in a discipline where like, you get your shit on and on time or else you fail and that's the way they have to learn from your class. You know, like everybody has their own, I think, culture within their yeah, it, it, professorship. You, you model what it is you want your students to be and to learn. And it doesn't exclude being great, having grace and mercy to them or, it, or, or cultivating empathy with them. Like empathy is understanding and understanding wherever it is that they're coming from so that you can better be there for them. Because not only are just, you know, are we educators or are we librarians or whatever it is that we may do within this university, we're human. Like, that's what we are. We're human. Yes. Yes, thank you. And I do, I do understand exactly what you're saying. <clears throat> I get a lot of complaints from students. I'm in a position that, you know, I'm the recipient of all those complaints in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I have to tell you that I come across this all the time, you know, that a professor was more flexible, another was not so flexible. There is a certain pattern. It's just a pattern. I don't have statistics. It would be wonderful one day to be more, you know, to have more scientific approach to it. That some privileged students from backgrounds that allow them to feel more entitled to, you know, just like go to the professor and just feel, tell them that they felt sick, that they were, you know, they had tissues at home and then you say, you have documentation, they need documentation from the other students. Some of them do not have that documentation, but still they are pushing this. And some of them, you know, manage to get what they want. The students from, you know, not so privileged backgrounds usually don't have the entitlement and they work so hard and they might have two jobs on top of their work for, for the university but they have not that you know they just keep going and going i'm not saying that everybody's like this mm -hmm. but i do find problematic to some extent and i can understand that to you know i mean that kind of customized treatment is okay and i do that all the time but there are certain issues here that are very problematic so this is where I go into the fact that you have to know your students. Like, it is very important to know your students. Yes. Do we have students who come from a life of privilege who will just come up one day and say that I need blah, 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 blah. Have, do I, have I had that? Yes. 
a student to question the fact that I was teaching multiple classes and how dare me teach multiple classes, but this is not anything against me. Well, clearly it is against me. You don't think I could do it. How dare you question the I have a whole have multiple degrees. You have what? <laughs> but do I go there with them? No, because I I know that one, I'm not worried about you. Two, I know eventually you're going to ask something of me. You're going to request something of me and it requires us to have a conversation about what it is that you're wanting. Do I just readily say, I'm giving this to the person? No, we have a conversation about it. What is it that you need and why do you need it? What is the time frame that you need it for? And because we sometimes, if we've already missed the deadline, you missed the deadline already. The only thing I can give you is this. And it might mean that I have, you can still turn it in, but I have to take points off because you've already missed it. I'm not going to allow you to not turn it in because not turning in means you get a zero and you can't make up a zero. But turn it in, but I'm going to have to take points off of it because it's already late. To me, that's still extending grace and mercy because I've allowed you to turn it in where somebody else might not have allowed you to turn it in at all. But, you know, you have professors that are teaching three classes and they might have 150 students mm -hmm. or even more. And I mean, I always feel, I'm a faculty member myself, but mm -hmm. I always feel really, um, you know, conflicted by having the professors having to make all these calls themselves when they, you know, you cannot just go by the way people look or people talk. I mean, this is far more deep than this. So how do you know them? How do you really know whether what they're telling you is, you know, is what they're telling you? And I always think, I would say, go with what they say. Hopefully, you know, that's okay. But I do feel for my colleagues that they have to make all these calls these days because this has increased dramatically since the pandemic. It, it has, and guess what? It's not gonna stop. It's, it's always been here. Um, I can remember my mother having to do the same um, when I was a child, watching her, and there was no cell phone. So her students calling her, her she works at a university. Her students calling her at 9, 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, why are they calling the house? <laughs> They're so rude and disrespectful. <laughs> why, why are they calling the house? But my mother explained to me then, she said, if I don't do it, who's going to? Like, and that stuck with me. And yes, it's hard. And yes, we have most, some, some professors, some faculty members have hundreds. And some do it and some don't. I really believe that it's a personal decision. And if you as a person decide, I just, I just can't do it, there's nothing wrong with that either. You can only do so much because in the end, you are only human. But these are also, from the beginning, the norms that you've set out from the beginning. You've told them from the beginning, I'm holding you accountable. This is an accountable space. So here are the norms for the classroom, and this is what we're doing. So therefore, I'm also valuing you and the diversity in those in the classroom. And in order to value you, you're gonna, you got to value me too and value my time that I have to put in it. You have to also, because of this, they have to feel like they belong. Now, not everybody's going to feel like belong, especially if it's a large classroom. But with that, how does it look like? How does it sound like? How does it feel like for you? When you, you were in a large classroom, if you've ever been in a large classroom, what did your professor do for you that instant that made you feel like you belonged there? Laura asked, in terms of missing a deadline, do you treat students who request an extension before the deadline differently from students who request an extension after the deadline? Do you take off points for one student but not the other? 
um, if it's before the deadline, if you get to me 48 hours before the deadline and it's and it's like a an actual like reason why you're missing, like had somebody who had to go have surgery. You're not you're not gonna make the deadline. Like you're not gonna make the deadline. But if it's someone who missed the deadline and they might have gotten the accident or whatever, and the deadline is passed, okay, I understand that. Again, it's it's a case by case. There might be somebody who's missed the deadline by a day. Just turn it in. Like just just turn it in. You miss it. Close it eleven fifty five. But I don't actually close it. But I just have an eleven fifty fifty nine counter on there, so I know how many days is late. Just just turn it in, Professor Hunter. I'm so I'm so sorry. It's it, I'm gonna turn it in right now. Okay, let's turn it in. They just don't know. I give them up to five days. That, that's me mentally. I give them up to five days. I don't tell them until they're watching now. <laughs> they know that. But mentally for myself, because it gives me time to grade. So I tell them that. Um, I hope that answered your question, Laura. So Let's quickly go into the technology and inclusivity because we know some people were asking about the technology part. Um, so we got a brick, and I know this is small. I'm sorry. I'm going to share this out with you all or have somebody. They should have put it on the website, but I'll have somebody do that for me so you all have a um, connection to it. So one of the things is bridging the gap with technology. Um, making sure, sure we have those digital platforms. I know that we already use a digital platform with the university, um, even though we may teach in person or online, but how can we make better use of it so that, say, we do have PLC, professional learning groups, uh, professional learning communities for our students, how can they better have access to them and use them better? Also, um, personalized learning ex uh, experiences. So we were talking about making sure we're bridging the gap within making sure that whatever it is that we're doing, our students still feel as if, oh, this is just for me. But it was for everybody. So that means that when we're looking at the assignments that we're given, um, and it's backwards learning or backwards planning. So we're planning what we want for our, the outcome. So we have this outcome that we have for our students. We want them to know at the end, how do we get them there? What technologies that, um, can we use? Now, Chad GPT is your friend. What matters is it's the prompt that you use within it. First, you have to teach ChatGPT who you are. Because you can't just put in and it doesn't, it can't just, I mean, it can, but you want to teach it who you are so that it knows how you want things formulated. So normally, if I want more things as far as technology is concerned, say with this STEM, and I want them to do their first activity. I want them to go outside, but I want them to post everything on Instagram and then have certain hashtags in it. I'm going to put into chat GPT, I am a university <laughs> professor. I work with incoming educators at the university level. They teach elementary students in these grade levels. We are working on <laughs> this assignment here but for the in-class portion of this assignment, I want them to utilize Instagram to help them prepare for the key assignment. And I'll put both assignments there and it'll give me everything that I want the students to do. Now, it'll put it in terms for what I need, but I need directions for my students. So for the next line, I'll put, give me student-facing directions and it will give me directions explicitly for my students. Now, can I tweak the words so that it makes sense for my students? Absolutely, and I usually tweak the words so that it makes sense. Now, my students have an activity that prepares them for their key assignment, but the last assignment that I have to, have to turn in, 
but they're starting on it now. So when they get it at the end, there's no surprise because they've been doing it. And they've been preparing for it. And that's how I've now integrated their technology. Now, inclusivity, I'm thinking about them at each grade level that they're doing. Also, I'm thinking about them as university students. What do they need to know? What are their outcomes that they need to have in order to be able to pass this class? So I also input those information in there as well. So I've used the technology that I want. I've implemented the technology that I need my students to use as well for them in social media because that's what I want. I want them to be able to give this information to not just themselves and to us in the classroom, but to others. And, uh, whoever it is that follow them, whether it's their school, whether it's other teachers or whatnot. And then we're also adapting to the hybrid learning environment. Now I know our in-person classes aren't always, we don't always put a Zoom link up for in-person classes. So just like we have this for today, if I have a student, because I usually tell them a lot of their schools are in a different quadrant of, uh, of DC. So there, some of them have to take tra public transportation. So it may take them 40 minutes to get to class and they've missed half of my class already because they're coming through DC traffic. If they text me, Professor, I'm stuck and I got a meeting here. Can I get a Zoom link? Absolutely. You sure can. I'll set up the camera for you today so you can log in through Zoom. Bam. They have what they need so that they can be successful so they haven't missed class. But if they're driving, I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> I will not do that for you because you need to get to where you're getting to safely. So what I'll do is I will turn on my AI. I'll turn on Zoom, but I'll do the AI translator. Uh, and so what it'll do is it'll give me a write out and a script for everything it is that we discussed, everybody, everything everybody said. So I'll print it or I'll put it in the um, the camera so you can see it at the end. So they, they still didn't miss anything. Any questions about that? Because I know you were asking about what to do as far as technology with my students. Were there any questions? Three minutes. We're done. So um, we're not going to worry about this part um, because what I want you all to do is, because um, we only have three minutes. Well, we'll do it within the next three minutes. Okay. So what I and say, we'll take the three minutes. Okay. For the next three minutes, go ahead and scan this code right here. What I want you all to do um, together, or you don't even have to scan it. Think of various ways amongst yourselves, ways that you can now implement within your classes, various uses of technology, however it may look, sound, or feel for you. And this may just be that, oh, I need to start using it. I'm not sure how I'm gonna use it, but I'm gonna start. Um, so let's take about like like a one or two minute discussion to do that, and then we'll wrap up. Sounds good to everybody? Okay. All right. So we won't start that timer. So you all can get up and you can stretch and move around. Y'all can sit in. <laughs> I think I can know. Wait, I think I can get it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it is. My perspective is that students get enough tech in the rest of their lives. And so my. Technology. So one of my suggestions was if you don't, if you're not using something, but you want to get like all your students working together or everybody. You're not using Padlet. Padlet is one that you can use. Padlet, uh, it looks like a big whiteboard. So, and then you can put sticky notes everywhere. So Padlet is one. Uh, and, and it's a great use of like getting materials and everyone. And you don't have to just use it as a sticky note. 
You can also use it to thank you for thank coming you so, so much. much. Yeah. Um, also use it to collect material. And so like if students have ideas, they can post their links and everything to pass with. I thank you all so much for coming. Yeah. Are there any questions for me outside of this? Anything that I can help anyone with? Yes, no, maybe so. Are they doing recall coffee in this building? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that they had coffee. They have coffee. Right. Oh, yeah. you've got your reusable cup. Yeah, it has tea in there. I'm going to get you some coffee.